One of the main things that I come across in my line of work is relationships, marital separations, divorces, relationship breakups, relationship conflicts, relationship turmoil. There's a lot to do with the trauma that both individuals experience. Right? Sometimes it's the case that one traumatized individual with a traumatized history, because they haven't worked on their own experiences and their own lifespan integration experiences, that traumatizes a healthy partner. Right? I see this so much, and it actually happened in my own life as well with my own past. So I've got some experience in this, not just from a professional point of view, but from a personal point of view as well. The reason I'm bringing this up is because sometimes it will happen where it's just not possible to reconcile the relationship. Sometimes it will happen where there is a break necessary. Sometimes it will happen where space is the only thing that can be given for all of the heightened emotions and whatever the perpetual thought processes might be, for all of that to calm down. If you look at it like you take a plastic bottle of water, you fill it up halfway, you put in just this much sand, right? And you go, you go like this. What's going to happen? The water is going to be cloudy, very, very cloudy. You won't be able to see through it. What this space does, however, is it allows all the dirt to sink. Sink to the bottom. So the top layer becomes clear. Now, in this particular example, the dirt and the cloudiness is represented by our emotions, okay? By our subjectivity, our subjective point of view. My hurt, my pain, my experience. How do I turn that around? It's your fault. You're responsible. I blame you. Okay, so this is what both sides look like. So when it happens, that space is really the only thing that, that can give solace. Let's call it solace. Space is the only thing that can give a distance and a break from all of these high-intensity emotions inside a friction-filled relationship. Then both parties involved are going to experience a certain sequence of emotional states. In breakups, fundamentally, regardless of whether the, the two individuals get back together or not, especially if there's children involved, these stages can take anything from six months to six years to 10 years to get through. And they all really depend on one thing and one thing only. The amount of time we spend in our thoughts versus the amount of time we practice being aware of our feelings and our nervous system states. We can be guided through this process of integrating and processing and all of processing all of these feelings. But the steps are as follow. And for you watching this, you might recognize some of these. So if you're going through a breakup at the moment or a separation or a divorce and you find yourself missing your life and missing your ex and missing spend, spending time with them and being sad and lonely and just overall down and unhappy, this is the process that you're in. Right immediately after the breakup, mostly what happens Obviously, this doesn't count. I'm not talking about happy, amicable, civil breakups. I'm not talking about people who have enough level of self-development and personal development and personal awareness where they actually have a conversation and they go, listen, our values don't align. Our emotional needs really can't be met because our values don't align. So we both decide together that the best thing to do is to separate and deal together still, whether it's co-parenting or if we don't have any children, then basically we, we part ways. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a relationship that ends under very, very difficult circumstances where there's very highly charged emotions, right? And a massive history of unhappiness and you did this and you did this and oh my God, I'm tss, I can't believe I did that and where there's pain, right? That's the kind of emotional, that's the kind of relationship breakup that I'm talking about. The first stages you're going to find is there's going to be shock, okay? 
Jacques is going to be there because usually the man in the relationship isn't aware of what's happening. The, the girl, the woman, she's usually the one that is planning the breakup. And the reason for that is it's time and women are emotionally much more developed naturally than men. Men are very practical by nature. It's to do with our historical conditioning. And um, when I say historical conditioning, I'm talking about thousand years, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 years ago. Right? We were primary care providers. You know, we were hunters, gatherers. We didn't look after the children. We were out hunting, quite literally. So our main job was, I need to get food to provide for the family, go back to the family, spend some time with my family. Then when the food runs out, maybe there's some danger, fight, protect my family from danger, go look for food again. Right? The women were the ones that were left to take care of the children, take care of themselves, take care of each other. So community in the sense of community, it really comes from that, from women being left when the men were out hunting because they still had to manage everything. And in order to manage everything, they had to communicate amongst each other and with each other in order to make sure that everybody plays a part in it. How is this related to, to relationship breakups? And I'm very happy you ask. Men have short vision when it comes to relationship. I'm not talking for all the men, right? Again, this is specific to relationships that end in a lot of pain, particularly high intensity emotional pain, because that comes from unprocessed historical trauma, either from childhood, adolescence, or adulthood. Probably complex PTSD is what we're talking about. So don't think that I'm generalizing about all men because then that assumption will just be not accurate. Men like these are short-sighted. They're short-sighted because they live very much in the moment, stuck in their bodies, all right? Their pain bodies, which means the amount of time that they spend in their minds is quite literally divided between how do I provide and when can I feel safe again? How do I provide? When can I relax? And when can I feel safe again? Whereas the female then on the other side, unless she is the one that has this trauma history, right? If she is the collateral parts of the male's trauma in the relationship then she goes okay long term of course she starts monitoring how is the behavior is it changing is he aware of that can i do something to help him does it work how does the effects how does it affect you know is he willing to change is he willing to do some work on this and then the relationship might be quite complex as well where there's financial dependency many many factors involved it comes to a point where enough shit has happened and the the pain has just become way heavier than the fear of starting again and this is then the catalyst when the pain became heavier than the fear of starting again and this is then the surprise part we're breaking up we're splitting up we're separating it's usually the individual that has the most amount of trauma in the relationship that is most surprised so for the rest of this conversation this shall be the protagonist then of the story, the traumatized individual. First is the shock. Second is the disbelief. What the hell? What's happened? What's going on? I don't understand. Why? You know, what did I do? Is it my fault? What did I do? What's going on? I don't really, really understand what's going on. Then there comes this anger. No, it's your fault. Why did you do that? You know, what the hell? Are you doing that? Are you are you cheating on me? Or are you spending time with other people? Um, this highly distrustful, just anger. Anger is just a projection, basically stopping us from owning that part of emotion inside of us. That, that's really what anger is. Anger is the ultimate defense mechanism that we actually use in order to not look at this very sensitive part of our own nervous system that still needs healing and processing and integrating into the whole. After the anger, Depending on the severity of the trauma history of the individual, there can come rage. Now, this can be dangerous and it can require crisis management and because rage is a very blind emotion. In Viking times, people that triggered rage voluntarily, right, either through plant medicine or through like, <coughs> building each other up, they were called berserkers. So they used rage, they used blind rage to fight 
and they were they fought like animals and they fought like machines the danger in rage lies that it doesn't have a scale so it doesn't have a volume switch where you turn it up or you turn it down anger you can turn anger up and go yeah i'm angry but you know it's okay or you can go i'm really angry i need to go for a walk or you can go mm. but rage is once you've already gone through all of those anger stages and it's just this jet fuel folds power very little conscious awareness blind machine very very dangerous after rage then once all these anger and projection emotions have been expressed after rage comes sadness so the sadness then is the internalization of okay obviously it's not going to help me to just continue to express all of these things and then that emotion gets turned in words and it's this sense of incredible loss because this is the first time that we start to consider our life without this individual the dynamics of why this emotion is so powerful in order to understand that we really have to go into what does the the idea and the cognitive constructs of spending a life building a life living a life with another individual represents right what does that involve basically we make a mental picture of the future and then we go okay my future is going to be with this person and then we go okay it's fine i don't have to think about it anymore right it's fine this person is in my life so this is what happens we have a mental representation a conceptual idea of this is what my future is going to be like what makes breakups separations and divorces so difficult is that picture it gets erased completely now all of a sudden we're left with this this vast emptiness of nothing just blank space and that shit is scary the unknown is incredibly scary right this is why some people choose to stay in unhappy and abusive and difficult relationships okay because that becomes still the comfort zone which is way more secure than the insecurity of the unknown it's how we're built we want to know and the more consistent we can be in what we know you know this is what we will go for most of the time especially if our behavior and our thoughts and our self talk is not conscious especially if it's not conscious then the sadness comes from okay yeah now all of these things that I imagine some my plans and then we go back into the past and we remember the happy times and we remember the joy and basically the warm and cuddly feelings that we remember of being with this person. The sadness is the fact that we come to this very slow subconscious realization of okay yeah. Now none of the things that I have experienced in the past I will experience with this person again. And consequently how we work then is we we translate that as I will never experience them ever again. We don't consider that yes, of course, you know, it is a very strong possibility that based on the sequence of events happening and transpiring in the present moment, you might not experience those things with this particular individual again. But that doesn't mean that you will never experience it again. But we don't think of that in the moment. Pain makes us blind to using the front parts of our brain prefrontal cortex it turns off our executive thinking functionality and um, the reason for that is our amygdala basically tells your body that you're in danger baby right so it automatically initializes your self protection mechanisms you, you go into fight flight freeze or fall it's just how we're designed then after the sadness you go into the nothingness and the nothingness is hard to get through this is where we can get depressed as because now we start to realize that i don't see a future i don't see a picture for the future i can't even think about it i just feel this this ache in my chest area and it hurts my stomach cramps and my brain doesn't work where has my thoughts gone dramatization but i have experienced that before and this is what it felt like for me for many people i i work with and i have spoken with and i have worked with this is what that feeling feels like broken hearts it's horrible <laughs> after this depression 
it comes to grief. The grief is really one of the beautiful stages where there is a sense of closure in the grief, where we, we go into our past memories and we, we reconcile them. You know, we, we look at, yes, this happened. You know, I'm, I'm sad that I'm not going to, or at least I think I'm not going to experience it anymore. And that sadness makes me grieve. You know, I'm sad because I'm not going to experience that anymore. I'm sad because of how it ended up and how it didn't work out. And then you go into these, this time... The fastest I've seen someone go through a grief right after ending up in a long term, after a long term relationship separation, probably nine months. Just this one state, right? Healthily going through it. The longest, someone was stuck in the stage for about 20 years. And then they, managed, they, find, they found me. 20 years. They were grieving a relationship. And the other person was still alive. If you're watching this and this applies to you, don't do that to yourself. Get help. There is help available for this. Now, obviously, I've gone through the shock, the disbelief. I've been angry about it. Yes, I punched a couple of holes in the wall and I broke a few things. Glad I didn't end up in prison, but, you know, I had to go to the doctor. Happened to me. I broke both my hands in my 20s. That's healed now. I, I'm still sad, you know, but I'm very happy the depressiveness, the depressedness is gone. I've experienced the grief. So now I'm coming to a stage where I realize that, okay, this picture of my future that I had, chances are likely that it doesn't exist anymore. It's not going to happen anymore. And if anything does happen with this individual, if by some miracle we get back, or if I end up in another relationship with someone, then it's not going to be the same. Okay, so then we come to this kind of very, very concrete place where we realize, okay, that picture is no more. The moment that we kind of realize this and we open up to this, we get access to our real-time nervous system information again. Part of this is now we start to experience loneliness. So you will find that as long as you keep busy, you're fine. But the moment you're alone and you experience anything intensity, high intensity, or not even very high intensity, but anything like joy, or sadness in a movie, right? Joy with friends, adventurous bliss out in a walk. Anything, any emotional, any emotional reaction really from your nervous system. Our default state is, oh my God, I want to share this with someone. So you go, oh, I wish I could share this with someone. And then we start missing the person again because the loneliness triggers. So what actually happens is your nervous system is experiencing uh, environmentally induced states. This state is joy, happiness, sadness, like we said before, varies. It can be any emotion. Your mind then as the translator, now it goes, okay, yes, Marcel, so what did I do in the past when I experienced all these things, these emotions that I'm experiencing now? What made it different? It goes, oh, yeah. I experienced it with this person. So your mind goes into your memory, into your hypothalamus, and it goes, oh yeah, oh yeah, do you remember this loneliness you feel? If you share this feeling that you're experiencing, this emotion, right, with that person again, then you won't feel this emptiness. You won't feel this loneliness. Our mind really does sabotage us quite tremendously. Right? Our mind can be our worst, worst enemy. So be aware of it. The tools you can use when you experience loneliness after a breakup. Keep yourself busy, socialize, do voluntary work. Animal shelters are fantastic if you're that kind of a person. Start a hobby, start fishing, tying flies, book clubs, anything that really keeps you busy. And if it's anything where you can transfer some attention and care and compassion, it's even better. All right, because those, those experiences, they charge our nervous system. Through this keeping busy, then it centers us. It's very difficult to, to just expect from yourself that, okay, yeah, I'm lonely now and you know, I'm, I'm going to feel it, I'm going to be strong, or I, I'm not going to feel this, I can't, I won't. Any internal behavior that we use to not acknowledge any feeling and emotion, 
that we're experiencing is, is bad for us in the long run. And because it suppresses what we're experiencing from a nervous system point of view, that doesn't get acknowledged, and it creates a barrier between your brain and your body. The information that, that 80% of information that's transferred through your vagus nerve to your brain stem, your limbic system, your prefrontal cortex, it stops, it stops, and it becomes a, a broken record on a loop because now every time that your body feels something, your brain goes into your memory to translate it, and it doesn't see real time what's happening. So you never know, is how I feel a memory of how I felt, or is how I feel how I feel right now? So this is the grief stage and the loneliness stage. After the loneliness stage, then this is where the graph starts getting it plateaus and then you start climbing again. Next is acknowledgement. Be very cautious during this step, right? Because most people would advise you and they would go, you just have to accept it. You just have to accept it. Let it go. Just accept it. This is how it is. Acceptance is, yes, a, str a part of this process. But before acceptance comes acknowledgement. Listen to that again. Before acceptance comes acknowledgement. So if you don't acknowledge something into existing, right? If you don't acknowledge a feeling's existence, how, how the fuck are we supposed to, to accept it if we don't even acknowledge that it exists? <laughs> you can't. Actually, it's necessary. One has to acknowledge something first. Once you've acknowledged that you can agree with it or you don't agree with it, once you've acknowledged that even you, you don't have to accept it, then it's, it's a side project, it's a side process that we go into, other stuff that needs to be dealt with. But if it's not acknowledged, it creates another freeze, another stop, that you, can, you run the risk of getting stuck inside this process then again. For the purpose of this video then, let's say, okay, I acknowledge that this happened, uh, six months has passed, or nine months has passed, or a year has passed since my breakup. Yeah, I've, I've experienced all of these different stages and emotions, and it was hard. And I'm finally at a stage where, you know, this happened. You know, I'm starting to understand why it happened, and I'm still sad, but I acknowledge that. Then we can say, yeah, I accept that this is a reality. This is the reality of how my life is right now. Pivotal stage. I accept this is the reality of how my life is right now. Basically, what it comes down to is that in order to get peace of mind, we learn to exist in the world as it is rather than how we want it to be. To have peace of mind, we learn to accept and acknowledge reality as it is instead of how we want it to be. So take that in as a template, put it on top of the conversation we're having now. I've experienced all of these things because I wanted, I didn't want this to happen or I wanted it to be different and I wanted my future still to be the same with this person. I didn't want to be in this situation. I never saw this. Oh my God, I come from a family of, yes, my parents had problems, but they stayed together for the kids. I could never see this happening to me. I'm so ashamed. This, all of this is, I want the future to be a certain way. I want my life to be a certain way. But every time we get stuck in this, I want my life to be a certain way, two things happen. Number one, we reinforce our trauma behaviors and all the corresponding defense and self-protection mechanisms. Okay, because this is a trauma thing. One of the main things that trauma instills in us is this really uncontrollable want and need to control our environments and relationships and we're shit scared of uncertainty because we've experienced something that was incredibly uncertain in the past. How do we not experience uncertainty by making sure we know exactly what the fuck is going on around us, right? Common sense. Not healthy. <laughs> not healthy at all. So, but anyways, if we don't acknowledge and accept that this is my reality right now, then we go into, okay, yeah, I still stay inside my trauma. I still want to control my environment. This is where expectations and disappointments come into play because everything we do then is a conditional behavior with an underlying intention of, okay, I'm doing this because I expect this to happen or I want this to happen. This is not the reality. So coming back into the reality, going, I am in the now. This is what happens. I acknowledge it and I accept it. Very, 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 very important. Otherwise, we still live inside an illusion. Right? We're not living in real time. We're not living in the now now. We're not acknowledging what our body is 
feeling. We're still projecting our, our conditional thoughts into the future. Self-protection. I want my life to be a certain way. If it's not that way, I won't be okay. But a healthy life, not necessarily happy, a healthy life is, I am feeling a certain way right now. Fucking ace it. I never want to feel like this anymore. But I'm going to honor it. I'm going to feel like this because this is what's happening right now. And that's okay. This method is called mindful self-compassion. Google Germer, mindful self-compassion, and you'll find it. The final stage then of this copious process. Once you've gone through, you've gone through shock, disbelief, anger, rage, sadness, depression, grief, loneliness, acknowledgement, acceptance. Finally, there's peace. Because now you're here. And from here, you can go anywhere you want. And that's okay. You're safe. This has been your life up until now. You've made mistakes. Things have happened. You've started dealing with it. And you will continue to deal with it. You're learning to be okay by yourself. You're learning to enjoy your own company. You're learning how to hear yourself again. You're learning that your body can talk and that it's sending you an extraordinary amount of information in the form of sensation and feeling. You're learning and you're happy about that. You're realizing that it's okay. These are the stages of a toxic relationship, breakup and separation as a result of either one or both individuals having a severe trauma history.